Our passage this morning is the entire chapter of 1 Peter 4. And as you're turning there, it's, just, it's throughout his entire letter that Peter uses this pattern of a, stating a truth, and then he follows that up with what that means for our Christian lives. And in this chapter here, we see that our identity in Christ and the fact that He is coming again, that gives us a new perspective, a, a new mindset in which we engage the world, engage other Christians, and we engage ourselves. But to see this, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. So before we read the text, will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you are the author of this word, that these are your words. They're living and active. They're sharper than any two-edged sword. And they may penetrate even our stony hearts. So we pray that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, to, and we, that we might behold your wonderful truth. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. First Peter 4, verses 1 to 19. Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased to sin from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached, even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the Spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded, for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each have re has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To Him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings, and that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous are scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. How is it that you and I are to live in this world? How is it that we are to live during our life? That's an important question, but... It's not necessarily the starting point. It's, it's not maybe the most important question, because what's more important is, who are you? How do you define yourself? And then you ask, why does that matter? We believe our sins are atoned for, that the blood of Christ has atoned for our sins. He's washed them away, that He's taken them away, and that we have been given his righteousness. His righteousness has been given to us. That's what we are clothed in when God looks at us. And this is truly wonderful news. This is what causes us to rejoice. But 
that's not the sum of our identity. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine. He is the vine and we are the branch. We are grafted into this vine. We would die and wither if we were not attached to Jesus. We are connected to him. The the Apostle Paul doesn't use the language Christian. He most frequently refers to us as in Christ. That is our identity. So, So right now, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and I ask, who are you? You can say, in Christ. I am in Christ. And so then what? Why does that matter? It's because it changes everything. It it gives us a new perspective in which we live. And that brings us to our first point. Because we are in Christ, we engage the world with a new perspective. We engage the world as Christians. We engage the world as followers of Christ. We bear His name by not living for human passions, but for His will. He says that there's been enough time to do what the Gentiles want to do, to to indulge in all of these passions. That that first term in verse 3, sensuality, it means a a lack of moral constraint, particularly with reference to, to sexuality, but even acts of violence. Passions here generally means like our human impulses that lead to immorality, but here that's indulging excessively. And, and then the next three terms all refer to eating excessively and drinking, much like they would do at festivals. But all of these terms share a similar idea of lacking self-control. That's a character flaw as Christians, because that leads to violating God's commandments. And so our life until Christ comes back is not a vacation in which we constantly hit the snooze button every time we're alerted to sin. So when it comes to our sin, Peter wants us to be vigilant, to be aware, paying attention, and using all of our time well. Do you believe that Jesus is coming back? And if you do, that means we need to be actively confronting this. We need to be preparing ourselves. We can't say that we follow Christ and then say, I'll stop doing this in a little while. I'll stop doing this sin after the next time. I'll get drunk on the golf course this weekend, and then after that, I'll stop. Because who is it really hurting anyway? When I'm, when I'm with my friends and we're hanging out, who does it really hurt? But what Peter's saying is that there's been enough time for that. And Peter says those passions have passed. We have a new mind, a new way of thinking. And so we engage the world with a new perspective. And it means that we live differently. Our priorities are changed. We have a different attitude toward the world. Why? Well, why is it that we have this new attitude? It's because through Christ, our sin is put to death. It's because Christ suffered and bore our sin. It's because you and I are in Christ. Because the same spirit that dwelled in Christ, the same spirit that resurrected him from the grave, dwells in you and me. We are new creatures. We are new creations. And so we live out that reality by abstaining. But by saying, I don't need to do that anymore. We don't completely stop from sinning. I'm sure if you look back on this past week, you'd probably say, yeah, I know that for certain. But Paul himself understands the, the struggle of continuing to sin when you don't want to. But what Peter's saying is we're not under the dominion to sin. We're, we're not slaves to sin anymore. We've been able to resist. But when we live like this, the world's not going to understand. The, the world will not understand why it is that you choose 
to abstain from these things. So perhaps family members may not understand why you don't talk about others who are not there anymore. Maybe that might have been a family pastime. Uh, you grew up and, and you heard about what others were doing when they weren't there, not in a positive way. And yet, as now a Christian, you say, I can't participate in that anymore. I can't speak about others in that way. And so what happens? You're called a goody two-shoes. You're, you're referred to as holier than thou now. That your family may not understand. Coworkers may not understand why you don't go to the work parties, because the work parties are just drinking parties. And, and you say, I can't, I can't do that anymore. Christ is at work in my life, and, and I can't participate in that anymore. And they're thinking, they look at you and wonder, what is wrong with you? Are you, are you, are you serious? Is, you're, you're really going to not come and, and not enjoy yourself because of what some person di- did 2,000 years ago? We, we live out this new reality. We, we abstain from these behaviors, and we might be tempted to think that we're missing out. Are we missing out because we're not actually doing these things? And that was the original temptation from Satan to Adam and Eve, that that they were missing out because God had commanded them not to eat of the fruit. That they were missing out. God was keeping something from them that was pleasurable, that was desirable. And what Peter is reminding us is that just as he talked about in the first chapter, that, that our inheritance is in heaven, that God is keeping it, that it is un- imperishable, it's undefiled. And so we have to ask ourselves, are, are we willing to trade something that's far more valuable than gold or silver for fleeting moments of pleasure and indulgence, uh, that those things in this life that don't really satisfy, are we we willing to trade them? Or are we willing to wait? Are we willing to endure, even ridicule, to follow Christ? Henry Light, who is best known for his hymn, Abide With Me, captures this section beautifully in the first two verses of his hymn, Jesus, I, my cross have taken. Jesus, I, my cross have taken, all to leave and follow thee, destitute, despised, forsaken, thou from hence my all shall be. Perish every fond ambition, all I've sought and hoped and known, yet how rich is my condition. God and Christ are still my own. Let the world despise and leave me. They have left my Savior too. Human hearts and looks deceive me. Thou art not like man untrue. And while thou shalt smile upon me, God of wisdom, love, and might, foes may hate me and friends disown me. Show thy face and all is bright. Even in the darkest of circumstances, even when foes may hate and friends disown, we have Christ. We have that which is far more precious, the light that shines in the darkness, and and we lack nothing. Storms can come through and destroy everything. Friends disown. This this sounds like Job, doesn't it? And yet when we have Christ, we lack nothing. So that is the new perspective in, in which we engage the world. But we also engage others with a new perspective. Peter introduces yet another statement followed by a therefore. Because this is true, it has implications. Because the end of all things is at hand, we engage other Christians in a new way. We we engage others differently. 
We engage others with a new perspective because we're expecting Christ to come again. And we know the phrase perhaps most famously used by Benjamin Franklin that there's nothing certain in life except what? Death and taxes. It's a funny joke, but Christians, you and I, should live with even more expectation that Jesus is coming again. It's certain, it's sure, He's promised He will. And so we know that it's going to come. Now, I'm not going to tell you when He's going to come back. Don't don't try to quote me on a date and time. I think that would just be laughed at the day after that comes and goes. And yet, Jesus says that day will come like a thief in the night. So we need to be prepared. We always live prepared, continually alert, expecting Him at any time. The King is coming. Are you prepared? We see how this new perspective causes us to engage others differently because Peter provides a list in verses 7 to 11. Many people fall into the trap of going to extremes. Either we, we think nothing matters, uh, we can doesn't matter to live faithfully, or maybe we become zealots and extremists. But Peter begins this list by saying we need to be self-controlled, to be sober-minded, that, that we need to be clear-thinking. And that's a matter of our prayer life. But then he immediately proceeds to verse 8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. I mean, the Apostle John gets, gets all the credit for being the Apostle of love. And, and partly rightly so, because of especially his chapters in 1 John. And yet how is it over and over Peter has love at the very center and and yet, this love covers a multitude of sins. This love is fervent, and it's forgiving. Peter quotes from Proverbs 10, Hatred stirs up strife, and lo- but love covers all offenses. Now it's important to know that, that love doesn't condone sin. It, it doesn't allow cover up sin in a way that allows it to continue. In the cases, especially things like abuse, which we're, we're dealing with in, as our nation right now, love doesn't cover it up because it is appropriate at times that the light of truth exposes the darkness of sin. But what Peter's saying is, it would be hateful of me if I knew your sin to share that with someone else unnecessarily. It's not loving. It's, it's tearing you down. It's slandering you. It's, it's tearing down your reputation. It's also not loving to tell your friend, would you pray for so-and-so? They're really struggling with pornography right now. They're, they're, they're struggling with alcohol right now. They're, they're struggling with fill-in-the-blank. Because we can put something under the guise of something spiritual. And you may truly desire that person to stop and to live a holy life, but but when we share those things unnecessarily, we're, we're really putting others in a position in which now they will be looked at with, with shame, perhaps. Uh, imagine telling, will you pray for Susie's daughter? She's struggling with whatever. And now when Susie's daughter comes and visits and comes to church, she sees people looking at her in a certain way that, that's not sympathetic, but judgmental. Now, now there's a proper way for, for sin to be exposed and we practice church discipline. That, that, that's important. But this love covers these sins, though. It covers all offenses. So we engage others with a new perspective, with this love that is fervent and forgiving, but it's also a love that is practical. It's practical in that we share our homes with one another without grumbling and complaining. During this period of time, Christians were dependent upon the hospitality of other Christians. 
when traveling. You couldn't pull out your first Bank of Ephesus credit card and, and book a hotel or a, a B&B in Philippi with, with a view of the Aegean Sea. Travel was dangerous, and they relied upon places that would take them in, where they could stay and be assisted. So throughout Scripture, hospitality is commanded and commended. Rosaria Butterfield's testimony captures the power of hospitality beautifully and powerfully for our age. Dr. Butterfield describes herself as a lesbian feminist professor. And after critiquing a particular evangelical movement in her local paper, this was in the 90s when papers, everybody still got papers, and she received a number of responses that week. And among them was one from a local pastor. And as she read through it, she couldn't figure out where to categorize it. She, she couldn't figure out whether this was hate mail or fan mail, because it, it didn't fit either category. And after a week of, of reading this letter again and again and thinking over it, she found herself taking up the offer in the letter to call and to continue that, to have a conversation with that pastor. And during the course of that conversation, uh, there was an offer extended to, to come over. To, he, he and his wife would have her over, and then they can continue this conversation about intellectual ideas and poetry and, and books and he even offered, if, if you're afraid to come over, we'd be delighted to meet you somewhere for dinner in a public place. And she took him up on the offer. And when she came over, she found that th- th- this was an opportunity she considered for her research. She was a, an unbeliever. And yet she thought, now I can see how Christians live. And what she found was that this pastor and his wife cared about her. They listened to her. They, they had a wonderful conversation about all of these different topics. And yet they did not once invite her to church or share the gospel with her. And she later says that if they had, it would have been so easy just to categorize that, to check it off, and to never meet with them again. And yet because they showed that they cared about her by listening to her, That at the end of the night, when he said, let's keep in contact, let's continue this conversation, she knew he was genuine. She knew it was safe. And so over the course of two years of of meeting on and off again, she eventually came to faith. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't invite somebody to church, you shouldn't share the gospel with them, but... There's a, there's a wisdom and a discernment of, of where somebody is at. And you may not feel that you can use your home to, to talk about intellectual ideas. That, that may not be your particular interest or skills, but our homes allow us a way to show our love and concern for one another in a real, tangible way. It gives of our time and our resources and says that this person is more valuable than those. So what's more valuable than your time? Uh, the world would tell you really nothing. It, your time is your time. Use it as you want. But, but when you give of that time, when you give of your space, the, the comfort of your home to others, it, it shows that they matter and you care about them. So we engage others, other Christians especially, but we engage others with this new perspective, but also by using our gifts to the benefit of others. Peter is not interested in giving us a a list of a hundred different spiritual gifts, and, and here's a little test in which you can take and figure out which one is yours. He says that we've received gifts. It's plain and simple, and and he summarizes them in teaching or speaking and serving gifts. They're both important, he says. But those who teach, those who serve, do not do so for their own glory. I think that's particularly challenging in our day of social media, in which, I mean, even in the past, certain teachers have been exalted, and and that's even more so today. 
I think people, when we serve others, we get a little less glory, a little less, our, our name is exalted a little bit less. But, but even then, the focus is not ourselves. The, the focus is others. An older minister shared with me a quote from Eric Alexander that I've thought pretty fr- a lot about, uh, I've thought about frequently in the past number of months. It's pray that as you preach and teach, people would be more aware of God's presence than your own. Pray that as you preach and teach, people would be more aware of God's presence than your own. Consider the parable of the talents and whether the Lord gives us one talent or two talents or five talents. I don't invest them. We don't invest them to make more for ourselves. They are gifts. They are given to us. And and just because I receive one talent, I, I'm not particularly skilled in it. It's a gift, but I, I don't have nearly as much as somebody else. doesn't mean I need to bury it and be ashamed or, or be frustrated that I don't have nearly as much skill as somebody else. If I've received ten talents and, and I'm particularly gifted at something, I don't try to double it and keep a little bit for myself. We use all of our gifts, our, our, whether it's speaking or whether it's serving, for others. So when we think about it, when, when we use our gifts, whether it's preaching or teaching, whether it's serving one another, whether it is hospitality, pray that as you serve... Others might see the presence of God more than your own. Because what does Peter say? To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Not not to Scott belong glory and dominion. Not to Jesus most of the glory and a little bit to Scott. To him, to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit belong all glory in all dominion, forever and ever. We engage others with this new perspective of love and of service because we've been given a limited amount of time, so we use it well. So we engage the world and we engage others with this new perspective. Finally, we engage ourselves with a new perspective. This might seem like an odd point, but what Peter's concerned about is our mindset, what it is that we're thinking, how it is that we approach circumstances in our life. Peter reminds these believers that a fiery trial will likely come upon them. So don't be surprised. So we first engage ourselves with this new mindset by expecting suffering. We live in a fallen and broken world. It's it's a world that prioritizes the pursuit of pleasure and rather humility and truth and glorifying God. I mean, how often is it that we cover up the truth because we don't want it exposed? And we have a historical account of that right here, beginning with Adam and Eve and Cain all the way through to the end. And at the very center is the only perfect and righteous man crucified on a cross after being exchanged for a murderer. We have this world in which it is not perfect. And Peter is reminding us that these fiery trials will come upon us. And these trials are a lot like what he spoke about in the first chapter. That this fiery trial is, is like the fire purifying gold and silver. It burns away all impurities to leave what is left as being pure gold, pure silver. There's many difficulties that you and I face. There's, there's many things that are not truly fiery trials. There's, there's many things that we face because we live in fallen bodies in a fallen world. There are other things that we face because of our own sin. And, but what Peter mentions here is a result of being faithful to God 
and holding to what is true and good by bearing the name of Christ and being a light unto the world. So we engage ourselves with this new perspective, this new mindset, by learning to rejoice in these sufferings. Now, it would not be right for me to tell you you should rejoice at the loss of a loved one or an illness or taking care of an aging parent who's experiencing declines in physical or or mental abilities. In those things, we can take comfort in the character of God. We can take comfort that that God knows and that He loves, that He sees, and, and that He is coming again, and that death does not have the final say. We have hope in the midst of those sufferings. But those are sufferings we grieve, sufferings we mourn. But those are sufferings because the world is not the way it's meant to be. And so when we talk about these sufferings, these sufferings that we can rejoice in, it's the sufferings because we are Christians. Those are sufferings that everyone experiences, whether you're a Christian or not. But when you became a Christian, and perhaps you weren't told this, but we take on additional sufferings. Sufferings because we live faithfully for Christ. When we become like Christ, we share in those sufferings. When we're persecuted for His name, when we're mocked and ridiculed for saying that Jesus Christ died and rose again, that He is the Son of God, when we're mocked or when we're shunned for holding to a biblical sexual ethic, when we're turned away, because we follow Christ. Those are additional sufferings. But we can rejoice in those because we have fellowship with Christ. Just like the three friends of Daniel who were thrown into that fiery furnace but found that they were not alone. So it is with us. We take comfort in God's presence. We take comfort, though, that we share with Christ in those things. And those sufferings point to postponed pleasures, like the violinist who spends hours and hours and hours and hours and hours practicing to eventually play that beautiful, complex piece of music. Or like the mother who undergoes what I can only say is unimaginable amounts of pain and change. And that pain is transformed into joy at the birth of a child. That's what we long for. We long for our sufferings to be transformed into joy, into glory. So that's how we engage ourselves with a new mindset. And, but we also do so by examining our lives. We can't always draw conclusions about why something is happening to us. But we are to look at our lives and and to see, perhaps, are are we actually sinning in some way that we aren't aware of? Because we don't want to be sinning in a way that brings persecution. Peter says, "Don't yet, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. We might be persecuted, because we're incredibly rude. And Peter's saying, don't suffer like that. Don't suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. And we ask ourselves, are we ashamed of Christ or are we actually glorifying Christ in this? What is our purpose in, in living this way? You know, We're not persecuted when we make some rude, snide comments on, on that news article and somebody says something back to us. That's not the persecution Peter's talking about. Yet, what it is is that we, we have to recognize, we have to ask ourselves, am I trying to make my own name great? Or am I trying to point others to Christ? Am I trying to live like Him to point others to Him? And in the end, all of these lead us to entrust ourselves to Him. We entrust our care to God we go all in. We push all the chips in. 
We commit entirely. We cast aside all fear because we know that when we return good for evil and we're suffer because of it, that God sees that. He knows. And there's a coming judgment when all things will be made right again. He will make that right in the end. Throughout Peter's letter, he regularly, he constantly reminds us that as Christians, we do not belong to this world. We are God's people. We belong to Him. Our citizenship is in heaven. And and because the end is at hand, because the end is coming, we aren't given permission to live as we like. But we live faithfully. We we live according to His will. And so it's with this new perspective. We engage the world by living faithfully. We engage others by being loving and hospitable. We engage ourselves by knowing that fiery trials will come but that we suffer with Christ. In her hymn, Hast Thou Heard Him, Seen Him, Known Him, Ora Rowan writes, What has stripped the seeming beauty from the idols of the earth? Not a sense of right or duty, but the sight of unsurpassed worth. Tis the look that melted Peter. Tis the face that Stephen saw. Tis the heart that wept with Mary can alone from idols draw. Draw and win and fill completely till the cup overflow the brim. What have we to do with idols who have sat with him? We have seen Jesus. We, we look into his wonderful face and all the things of earth grow strangely dim. The, the, the glitter of that sin, of those choices, of, of what the world puts before us has gone dull when we compare it to Christ. And so I ask you, have you heard Him, seen Him, known Him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know that in all of these commandments, We can only fulfill them. We can only live this way by strength that you provide. By day by day, morning by morning, looking to Christ. That he might grow bigger each day to us. That that he might grow more glorious. For we could grow, he could grow more glorious to us each day and it still not match just how glorious he is. Lord, may all the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of His face. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.